Hello everyone, this is Joe Minardi. Welcome again to the WVU Emergency Medicine Recording Studios. I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about how point of care ultrasound can change the way you practice in patients with acute or worsening shortness of breath. You can make immediate decisions at the bedside that will save lives and save time so you're not having to wait around on other tests like x-rays, BNPs, and blood gases. So with that, let's move on in. Well, here are our CME objectives. I'll let you look through those. Those will be posted on later, so so I'll skip reading them to you for now. I just want to go through, here's a quick scenario and we'll go through a few others. Here, let me just put out a case to you like this. So you have a 65 year old male, they're short of breath, either they come into the emergency department and they're short of breath, or maybe they have new or worsening shortness of breath while they're admitted on the floor or in the ICU. They've got all kinds of medical history, like many of our Appalachian patients here do, congestive heart failure, coronary artery disease, COPD. You see the patient has increased work of breathing. You don't hear a lot of breath sounds. Maybe you hear some faint wheezes and some crackles and so think about it what would you normally do say and you haven't learned to use ultrasound yet or it's something that's just kind of barely entering its way into your practice so maybe you order a chest x-ray maybe blood gas a bnp maybe you do some albuterol some nitroglycerin some lasix maybe you do some antibiotics early on you're getting started so i have little nicknames for these that i like to call so this is guessing and this is waiting these are things i don't like to do i'm very impatient i don't like waiting i don't like guessing what i'm going to go through are some ways how you can use point of care ultrasound to minimize or decrease the amount of of guessing and waiting that you're going to have to do with these patients that are short of breath. So with heart point of care ultrasound and lung point of care ultrasound, the order in which you do these doesn't really matter. Just work on your practice and something that feels comfortable to you. Sometimes you're going to change it depending on the clinical scenario. Ultimately, when patients are short of breath, you really want to look at their heart and their lungs. They really work together. If you do both of these in these patients who are acutely short of breath or decompensating or worsening on the floor or in the ICU, then you're going to be able to get some immediate actionable answers that are going to drastically shorten your differential ease your cognitive load, and probably save lives and definitely save time, money, and resources in the care of your patients. So the way I like to break this down is when you have the patient in front of you, when you're confronted with a patient who's short of breath, you have a few questions you want to answer with point of care ultrasound. And they break down into cardiovascular, respiratory, or are you dealing with something that's none of those things. So first couple questions are, does the patient have tamponade? Do they have a massive PE? Or do they have signs of CHF? So those are some of your immediate cardiovascular causes and questions that you can answer with point of care ultrasound. From the respiratory perspective, then you ask yourself, is the pneumothorax, is there a pleural collection of some sort, or are there other pulmonary, inflammatory, or infectious findings that point you to a respiratory source like bronchiolitis, or a pneumonitis, or a pneumonia, or something like that. And then kind of lastly, in the absence of any of these things, then probably you're dealing with either COPD or asthma, or none of those things. Now I will point out, when we talk about pulmonary embolism, we're talking massive pulmonary embolism. So we may rule out all of these things, may see none of this, none of this, maybe we don't think it's this. Um, they still could have a small or a mild PE, but these aren't patients who are sick and laboring in front of you. Patients with small minor PEs are the patients where you can think a little bit longer and run through a perk or a wells or something else like that. We're talking about the patients who are short of breath in front of you, who look a little bit bad, and you need to make immediate decisions. So cardiovascular causes, respiratory causes, or something else completely, and we'll, we'll run through some of this. So first off, let's go through some representative cases. So uh, this first one, 59 year old male who's admitted for pneumonia and sepsis, still looking a little sick, hypotensive, a little tachycardic, x ray, just looks like a mess, right? And then maybe we see some things on their ultrasound that may change the way we're going to manage this patient. Our next case is a 47 year old female who's admitted with ARDS in the ICU on the ventilator. Things seem to be getting worse pretty quickly, increasing airway pressures. The patient's hypoxic, they're hypotensive, and maybe an ultrasound can help us in dealing with this patient and making some decisions right away. Our next patient's a 49-year-old female who has chest pressure and shortness of breath on exertion. Looks okay, feels pretty good at rest. Blood pressure vitals don't look terrible, but maybe the point of care ultrasound may change the path that we want to go in working up this patient. Here's another patient who's a 43-year-old, healthy male. Cough, some shortness of breath, lots of visits in the past few months, no definitive diagnoses, been on lots of different therapies for reflux, bronchitis. Vitals don't look too bad, but maybe if we use point of care ultrasound, we can arrive at a more important and timely and accurate diagnosis than we've been getting so far in these prior visits. The next case, 69 year old female who shows up with shortness of breath for a few days. You hear some faint crackles and wheezes in the lungs. Blood pressure is okay. Heart rate's okay, but they're pretty hypoxic. And so we have some of the initial standard findings, but maybe there's more here that we could address that may help this patient immediately. This next one's a 58 year old male. He's got shortness of breath for a few days, history 
of CHF. Lung crackles are heard on the physical examination. Vital signs, blood pressure is looking a little weak, a little tachycardic, a little hypoxic. So now you've got this patient who's a little hypotensive, but maybe you're thinking you want to start a diurese, but that raises a little conundrum. So maybe ultrasound can help clarify this person a little bit as well. Now I'd like to go into a little bit about how I like to approach the short of breath patient, uh, starting with kind of physiology and etiologies and then findings. And most of this with an eye towards using point of care ultrasound to help us make some of these decisions. So when I think about patients who are short of breath, I think about is it a respiratory or is it a non-respiratory cause? When we get into respiratory, it can be either kind of an upper airway thing where there's an obstruction or there's laryngeal edema or it's an anaphylactic thing where they've got airway swelling or is this a lower respiratory phenomenon? So this is what we see very commonly, right? We see uh, pneumonia and COPD and things like that or is this extra pulmonary? So there's compression from fluid, uh, air or something like that. Then in the non-respiratory side, we've got things that are maybe cardiovascular, and we have kind of a nice list of those. Then we have these other things that maybe ultrasound isn't going to help us with as much. However, as we exclude things, our differential gets shorter and may point us in some of these directions. So things like that are cellular and metabolic, neuromuscular. So maybe they're very anemic. Uh, maybe they've got carbon monoxide poisoning, something like that. Maybe they've got botulism. So a less common things, things that we're probably not going to diagnose strictly by physical examination alone, but with other history and other workup maybe. So back over to the upper respiratory that's mostly going to be clinical, right? We're going to see things like strider or see signs of airway swelling, or we may have some other history and physical exam findings that are going to guide us. So ultrasound is probably not going to help us much on this one, but with ultrasound and all of our clues, we can narrow things. Lower respiratory, so we've got parenchymal disease and we've got COPD and asthma. And then the extra pulmonary, largely talking about pneumothorax and pleural collections, although you could go crazy with things like burns and abdominal compartment syndrome, ascites sometimes can even be a significant cause. So abdominal causes as well. Certainly not all inclusive, but some of the big things, especially things that ultrasound can help us with. COPD asthma is mostly going to be a clinical diagnosis. However, the absence of other findings may help us strengthen or improve the accuracy of this diagnosis when we apply ultrasound to these patients. With most parenchymal disease, we should have findings when in lung ultrasound. It there are some rare cases where they may not be close enough to the periphery where we can see them, but most of the time we're going to see some kind of pleural abnormalities, thickening or irregularities, irregular distribution of beelines, so maybe only in one spot or skipping around or patchy areas of beelines, and there's some other lesions that we'll look at and talk about. Pneumothorax is pretty straightforward, so the ultrasound findings are going to be lack of sliding and maybe a lung point, and then pleural collections are also readily and easily diagnosed at the bedside with ultrasound, so usually it's going to be fluid, it may be complex fluid, or we may see really nasty looking empyemas or other collections. On the non-respiratory side, we've got the neuromuscular things that can cause shortness of breath. That's mostly going to be clinical and other modalities that are going to help us diagnose that. Same thing with cellular and metabolic. Clinical findings, other labs, blood gases are going to help lead us to those diagnoses. But again, after other things are excluded, these other things can kind of rise on our differential diagnoses. So ultrasound still helps us even if it doesn't directly make diagnoses such as these. And then the cardiovascular things are all pretty readily diagnosable with point of care ultrasound. Things like tamponade, congestion of heart failure, massive PE. Now, again, I should use the disclaimer that we're not talking about smaller segmental, subsegmental pulmonary emboli. We're talking about massive and submassive, all of which should have findings on ultrasound. So if we think by our ultrasound, massive or submassive PE is unlikely, we still need to consider whether a segmental or subsegmental or some smaller pulmonary embolism is still in the consideration and worth pursuing further. But if it is submassive or massive PE, we should see some findings, primarily dilation of the right ventricle. Pleural infarcts are something that are described I'm not going to go into a lot of detail of those because I have not mastered those and I'm not sure what the general world's appetite is for searching every inch of lung for small pleural infarcts. But also if we're at the bedside and we're trying to decide is this a massive pulmonary embolism, sometimes looking for a source clot in the extremities or wherever we think it may have originated, may be worthwhile. CHF, we should see regularly distributed beelines. Now I'm generalizing to some degree, but in most cases of congestive heart failure, we should see beelines that are fairly symmetric and fairly regularly distributed distributed, usually a little bit more towards the bases. And that's classic. Of course, there can always be variations, but the general overwhelming majority of CHF cases are going to have regularly distributed symmetric beelines in the lungs that are a little bit more towards the bases. When we look at the heart, we also need to make note of, is this left ventricular just pump failure where the pump is pumping poorly or are there mechanical causes? Now, the mechanical causes are less common, but they do exist. And especially in my population in Appalachia, where there is a high incidence of IV drug use, endocarditis, and things that can cause mechanical etiology 
opportunities of heart failure. And then the last cardiovascular thing, tamponade, where we see pericardial effusion. It looks busy when you add everything in there, but I think this framework makes sense from a physiologic and a diagnostic perspective, and it helps me make sense of these patients and sort my way through their differentials very quickly. So again, the questions we're going to answer, is it cardiovascular, is it respiratory, or something else? So quickly, when we look at the heart, and I like to start with the heart first, we can rule out tamponade, we can rule out massive PE, again, smaller PEs may still need to be considered. We can look for signs of CHF. On the respiratory side, we can look for pneumothorax, pleural collections, pulmonary or inflammatory findings. In the absence of any of these things, along with the clinical information, be able to arrive at a diagnosis of COPD or asthma. Or maybe it's none of these things. So maybe, again, still maybe a smaller pulmonary embolism is on the list, or it's neuromuscular, cellular, metabolic, something else like that.